so um, I know I sort of introduced myself a minute ago, but for those who are online, I'm Katie Hodgson, speech language pathologist with expertise in social um, development, executive function, and self-regulation. Um, I have been a speech language pathologist for over like 20 years. Um, <laughs> and this has been my passion. It was, wasn't my original passion, believe it or not, but I started working in a public school in Massachusetts and saw these really sort of bright kids who academically could do the work, but were really falling through the cracks because of social um, challenges, executive function challenges, and self-regulation challenges. And I really felt like, gosh, this population needs support. And so um, that sort of launched me on my path to specializing in this area. By the way, interrupt at any point if you have a question. Um, and can they message you if they have a question? Is yeah, that, so absolutely. you just jump in if somebody has a yeah, question? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so a lot of the strategies I'm going to talk about are based on Michelle Garcia work of social thinking. Um, I don't use that methodology strictly. I use a variety, but the philosophy and methodology, I think, is a great way to kind of think about the social mind. And so I'm going to use a lot of her um, approaches and sort of helping you to understand um, the social mind and strategies for kind of improving um, social development. I don't get paid. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about what is the social mind. We're going to talk about social skills versus developing social thinking. Um, we're going to talk about four steps to becoming a social thinker. And um, I'm going to give you a, a couple visuals to help you kind of think about um, how to approach social skills with your kid, child. Okay. So, okay. So there are, can you see Brandy? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are several aspects of um, being social. So within milliseconds, our brains, if we don't have a social challenge, our brain reads the contextual cues. Our brain uh, reads the nonverbal cues. Our brain processes, here's the verbal message, processes it, makes sense of it, and then after we've received all those messages, it interprets it, problem solves, and figures out how do I respond in this situation. And it takes literally milliseconds. For kids with social challenges, it's not that easy. For them, they're sort of thinking about, um, wow, okay, so she's sitting in the chair, she's looking at me, so I think she wants me to talk, right? Like, it's very cognitive. If you think about something that's not easy for you, like what, for me, it's cooking. Like, cooking, I can't have any distractions, nobody can talk to me, like, I have to, I mix up tablespoon, teaspoon all the time, and I can read it, like, three different times. For me, it's a very cognitive task. It's not natural. Um, can you think of something for you that really takes a lot of mental effort to do? Sure. I would say like sometimes writing. Yeah, writing. Yeah, yeah. emailing. I emailing. Can't just, like, shoot yeah, you know, yeah. I need that minute. Cooking. Cooking. Yeah. You get it. Yeah. Putting stuff together. Like, yeah. That has intricate instructions. Yes. Forget. Right. Don't you talk like. To me. Don't talk to me. I'm right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still thinking. Still thinking. Uh, not interrupting my wife. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, so those are things. And so if we don't have social um, challenges, we don't even think about what happens socially. It's just like taking a drink and swallowing. Like you don't think about it. You don't think about breathing. Like it, there's some things that are just intuitive that are not intuitive to your child's brain. And so it's really about helping them to understand it and and be able to develop some strategies related to that so um so if you think about i don't know if you noticed but i asked everybody a question about age and and their child before this started and then i just looked at you and i didn't ask you a question but you said my son's jack and he's this old right and so you read my nonverbal cues that was totally context 
It was totally nonverbal. 90% of our communication is nonverbal, tone of voice, body language, context cues. And so if your kid struggles with that piece, they're only hearing the verbal message, which can lead to literal interpretations or misinterpretations and things like that. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, okay. All right, so this is just sort of a visual of that, right? So there's that social attention. So that's our social radar. So being able to use our eyes and our brain to find the nonverbal cues, the contextual cues, and be able to tune into them. That's really what social attention is. And of course, attending to what people are saying. Um, social interpretation, like what's the meaning? Um, decision making, how am I going to respond? What's the socially expected response? And then actually the social response. Um, so this is just kind of a visual of that. Questions about it? No. Okay. All right. So one of the things that I always like to touch on um, about looking at social development is looking at evaluations. Um, just like with any field, not all evaluators have expertise in evaluating social competencies. And the reason is, if we look at standardized testing of social competencies, what typically happens is they're shown a picture and there you say, okay, so you give them a little scenario. Okay, so-and-so gave so-and-so a present, how should they respond? So given enough time and your children have the intellectual abilities to be able to figure out that content but the piece that's missing is the what and the how. It's not testing the what and the how. And for kids who struggle with social nuances, which are higher sort of social skills, that's what we really need to look at. And the only way we can look at that is really through dynamic interactions, right? So when I do a, a free intake and I'm interacting with that child, I'm looking and evaluating in that moment, how are they interacting with me? How are they responding to what I'm saying, the play situation, uh, what's their mental flexibility, things like that in the short period of time that I'm doing that because that's where it starts to unfold. You know, you hear about, you hear about where maybe your child might struggle the most, it's often lunch, it's often recess. It's the unstructured times, the structured time of looking at a picture and describing it or sitting at my desk and following that the expectation is the teacher talks, I raise my hand. Like that rule has been instilled in them since kindergarten, right? So it's this pattern that I know and I've learned. But social interactions are so dynamic and change constantly and aren't structured, right? And so helping them to kind of learn how to interpret it and um, be able to um, develop those strategies, but I was talking about evaluations. So that's why it's really important that you have an evaluator who can really evaluate the how and the what. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So um, I always say, you know, it's sort of like, it's sort of like going to just a general oncologist versus, you know, a breast cancer, right? Like specialist, right? You always want the person who really gets it. And a lot of times kids, your minds of your kids are sometimes misunderstood. And so the right people is really important. Okay, so when we think about social development and social competency, this is a great kind of way to think about where the social nuances kind of fall apart a little bit. So initiation, oftentimes kids might struggle with initiation and that can look in one or two ways. So one way is they're quiet and don't really say anything and don't know how to engage or jump in. And it could be either verbally or at the playground, the kids are all playing tag and they don't know how to like get their body in. Oftentimes if you see initiation difficulties socially, you also see them in other aspects. So things like getting started with homework, getting started like with the morning routine, getting started with like eating their cereal, right? So initiation can go across all kind of areas of life, but socially initiation um, can sort of look like that, like delay of just sort of like that, I don't know what to do, right? I just stand there. And so kids misinterpret that as 
well, you don't want to play with me, right? Because your body's out of the group. You're not saying anything, so you must want to be alone. And the kid on the inside is like, I'm lonely. Nobody wants to play with me, right? And so we get this sort of vicious cycle. The other part of initiation is overly initiating, right? I think of, I call it the steamroller effect, right? The, the, the child who comes in and is like, everything in their mind is like, bah, 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 and they aren't sort of tuning into the other people in the room or not giving a chance for other people to engage. They're just sort of like, I'm on this mission. You'll see a lot of interrupting, maybe calling out in class, right? They're like not sort of self-regulating that piece um, and they're overly initiating. So listening with your eyes and brain, and I'm gonna go into this into more detail in another slide, but <clears throat> um, let me get some water. So, Listening with your brain and your eyes. I'm going to give you an example. Actually, I'll do that later. I take that back. Listening with your brain and your eyes. That has to do with the social radar, right? Are you tuning into the cues in your environment? When I say cues, like context cues, nonverbal cues, do you feel like you have an understanding of what I mean, or would it be helpful to provide some examples? Understand? Anybody feel like more detail would be helpful? No. Okay. So that's really side of having your brain think about what's happening and not being stuck either on sort of your own internal thoughts. Or I'm playing with Legos right now and people are trying to play with me or talk to me, or and I can't shift my brain from this, right? So that can be what that looks like as well. So abstract thinking and inferential language. So a lot of times kids who struggle with social challenges also are very black and white thinkers. They're very literal, right? So um, I will give an example of, so oftentimes like kids that, who can be really literal, I will say, um, like, let's say they have a runny nose or they're coughing or, right? Do you need a tissue? No. I mean, if we snot dripping down their face, but in their mind, no, they don't need a tissue. Like they're fine with the fact that the snot's dripping down their face. I need them to use a tissue because socially, I find it like it's kind of gross and other people will find it gross. And so really what I'm asking them is would you mind getting a tissue and blowing your nose because socially when we have snot it's one can spread germs and two it can feel like ew like that's one of those like ew things it's sort of like farting in the group it's kind of like an ew thing right and so it being able to interpret and understand sort of the hidden meaning both um, in verbal messages like the, do you need the tissue or nonverbal, right? So the kid comes over to play and all of a sudden the kids turn like this, right? So I'm telling you, I don't wanna play with you. And when I, when you keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, I'm gonna keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, right? And not picking up on those cues. Does that make sense? Okay, um, big picture. So oftentimes kids who struggle with social nuances get stuck in the weeds of the details. Like you were talking about sort of how your son changes, like his interests might change, but he goes down that rabbit hole of learning everything there is to know about that thing. And that's very common with kids with social nuances and they miss the big picture. So um, oftentimes because of this, traditional consequences and rewards don't work as a parenting approach because in that moment, okay, so you took away my phone, I have Legos. Right, they're not seeing the big picture of, oh, I wanna to talk to my friends or I wanna play that video game. Like in this moment, whatever, I'm gonna do this instead, right? And so um, they also will miss that big picture of, so if I fart in class and somebody thinks it's funny, right? And really they're laughing because um, it's unexpected at a certain age, right? And I think, and I see that everybody laughs I'm like, oh, this is funny. And so I keep doing it. And the kids like eventually stop laughing. So missing sort of the big picture that sort of one, things are funny once. And two, um, they actually might've not been laughing at the joke 
but laughing that it was unexpected. And then three, if I keep doing it, how does it impact me in terms of developing friendships and that goal of mine? So oftentimes they might understand, if I call you a jerk, it's gonna hurt your feelings. But if I'm kind to you, it won't. But the, and sometimes kids will be like, who have struggled with social nuances will be like, so what, I think they're a jerk. So I just told them they're a jerk. Like, why does that matter? And the piece that they need to understand is how does it then come back and impact them and their goals? Like that's what part of the reason why it matters, but that's the big picture that they're missing. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, okay. And then humor, humor. So humor um, can look different in different kids. Um, a lot of kids I work with who struggle with social nuances, sometimes um, sort of like with my gas example, they might get the kids to laugh once. And so they think, ah, oh, this felt really good. I'm gonna be the jokester. But they may not actually get humor. And so they may just be sort of missing the mark a smidge and not really be funny. Um, sometimes they struggle with understanding being laughing with versus laughing at. Um, and oftentimes, I also have, um, particularly with teenagers as they start to get older, I have the kids who make jokes not realizing they're either offensive or sexually inappropriate, right? And, and, and knowing context, right? You might make that joke when it's you and a buddy, but you wouldn't make it to your mom, right? Like, so understanding context and how we interact differently with different people. Um, so humor can be really tricky to navigate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions about ILAF? Does a lot of this fall under executive, weak executive function? That's a great question. So um, there's overlap. But so executive function is um, an umbrella term that basically means um, initiation, planning and prioritizing, time management, organization, metacognition, which is being able to think about the way you think, and self-regulation, right? So I can struggle, and often the kids I work with, I'll see like that profile of, I struggle with executive function, social skills, and some self-regulation. There's a lot of overlap, right? And so I will see kids who struggle with all of them, they don't have to struggle, but it is a common overlap, right? Like we talked about with initiation, initiation with homework versus initiation socially. Initiation can be considered an executive function skill, right? As well as a social skill. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Wrong way. Ah. Okay, so um, this, uh, I'm, just gonna briefly talk about this. So this approach is a very um, sort of cognitive approach. And so it takes a lot of social problem solving. It's really geared towards kids with average to above average intelligence who are, who are able to engage in social problem solving. This is an approach that you would use with everybody, um, but it is really good for kids who are pretty much on par with their peers in terms of cognition, academics. Maybe they have a specific learning disability in reading, but. Other than that, you know, they're pretty much on par, but they really struggle with those social nuances, executive function, and um, um, social skills. Okay, so we're gonna do a little experiment. Um, so if I ask Brandy what two plus two is, and she says, Four. And I give her a sticker. You're like, oh, that feels good, right? And then Laura, if I if Laura says, well, actually it's five, and I just say, no sticker for you. Have I what have I taught them? To not speak up. Uh, not, not very good at math. Not very good at math. But also speak it's like up. you're socially isolating, like you're well, social kind of isolation. Yeah, they're speaking out and they're trying to help, they're trying mm -hmm. to be able to just then and they're like shutting it down. Yeah. How about about math? She didn't learn what she didn't learn how to solve it. Right. She didn't learn how to solve it. She didn't learn why it was four and not five. She didn't learn the why or the how behind it. 
And so I, a lot of times what will happen is, um, I'm originally from Massachusetts, so sometimes I'll make reference to up north versus here, and there are some differences in terms of how things are approached. And one of the things that I've noticed here is like you get a um, child with either a diagnosis of high functioning autism or even just like social challenges and like you get your stamp card for ABA. Okay. And that's not a good fit for these kids because we're not teaching the what or the how or the why, which is what they need to know. We're just teaching compliance, right? I want you to look at me. Good job looking at me. Right. And I give you a sticker. So I worked with a high schooler who on intake, I, he had done ABA his whole life. What's, I, what's ABA? I love that you asked. Applied behavioral analysis. Oh, okay. Big picture, it's um, sort of positive reinforcement for positive behaviors, okay. right? So um, be doing what you're supposed to do, what's expected. Um, so I worked with a high schooler who had been in ABA his whole life, and when I was um, talking to him, it was it was literally like, "Hi, how are you?" But oh, what what's, what do you like to do? Baseball. Right, so is he making eye contact with me? Yes. Yeah. Is it meaningful? Is he picking up my social cues? Is he reading the situation? No, he's following a rule. I'm supposed to look at you. I'm supposed to look at you. I'm supposed to look at you. And what kids who are really bright need to learn is the how and why and the social problem solving in order to build meaningful relationships and be able to um, you know, be it, have a job one day and be able to live on their own and be able to you know, go to college if that's a path for them, right? Like these are, it's it's deeper than that. ABA is really good for kids who um, aren't as skilled, right? But for kids who are pretty much on par with their peers, it's not the right fit. It really needs to be something deeper. So, yeah, go ahead. Just to, not to interrupt, but no, I wanted to here. say like, Katie, this is something that I think for myself, I am not from like South Carolina. And so when I moved here like two and a half years ago, I was used to a whole different approach with how they work with children. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm coming from up north as well, you know, the northeast. Um, there are just some differences of how what they have available to provide for resources for children that are not because ABA is not what uh, what kids that have dyslexia or dysgraphia or auditory processing. ADHD, I mean, they're usually most of the kids or even higher level mm -hmm. um, autism that you're high functioning, very bright kids that are fit into that role. They just need different work and like ABA is not what they need. And I actually had someone come to my house to do this when I first moved here. And I'm like, this is not what I'm looking for. Like, this is not going to work because mm -hmm. I was looking for what she's talking about. And it's mm -hmm. so hard to find yeah. and I, every person down here understands that concept because they're focusing on something else and that's not what you're looking for. So yeah, I think that what she's talking about works. Um, with my kids, I do a lot of social I do a lot of social um, mentoring them, like they yeah. see what I'm doing. Like, so if you in the house and you have friends and you all of a sudden disappear, mm -hmm. well, that's not like, well, we really can't do that. Like right. that's not within the social norm because they're going to think you don't want to play with them because you went to your room. Now, maybe you needed some time away because you were overly too much, you know, stimuli and you needed just a break, mm -hmm. but you got to let them know that and yeah. communicate that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I was just like, that's great insight. And I love the example you provided about sort of coaching your own kids in those situations and sort of giving them the information they need to understand the impact of their actions and a solution, right? It's okay that you're overstimulated. You just have to tell them, like, gosh, I I totally, like, I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, time out, can I just go over here and like, yeah. you can still play, but can we just be quiet and go, I can yes. call her over here for like maybe 10 minutes and then and I'll then, come back. Yes. And so I help my kids do that mm -hmm. when they're in the moment because kids, friends are gonna be like, well, why did you do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm ready to go then, you don't want yeah. to go yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, one of the things I think about, so behavior, I think sometimes has gotten a negative connotation, like, oh, the kid's a behavior problem, right? And a lot of times kids with social challenges 
or impulse control, self-regulation, get mislabeled sort of like behavior problem. And we need to like stop the behavior. And what we really need to think about is why is that behavior happening? So I'll give you an example. I'm working with a kid who has ADHD and high functioning autism and he was getting in trouble every day in school. And so I went to do a school observation and he's just like oh, in his seat, wiggling, getting up, wiggling, getting up, wiggling, getting up. And so I talked to him afterwards and you know, said, so what's your brain thinking about and what's your body feeling that is you think is driving sort of the wiggle? He's eight. And he was like, well, I just feel fidgety. Like, I feel like I need something to like move with my body. So we came up with some strategies to help him get that movement that would allow him to still think about the teacher. And then the other piece he shared was, well, I have trouble with the bathroom. I can't get my zipper down. And so I pull my pants down, but when I do that, sometimes it goes down my leg. And so I have uncut, my pants are a little wet and it's uncomfortable and I can't focus. All I think about is the wetness, right? So if we had just taken a behavior approach and said, all right, you get to, you get a sticker or a check every time you stop wiggling, we're not addressing the issue or teaching a skill, right? He needs to learn that fine motor skill of the zipper, or we need to change the type of pants he has, or we need to teach him a different way to go to the bathroom, right? Like there's three solutions that are options, but we need to just look at it differently. Does that make sense? Okay. One thing I often hear is um, the kid's lazy. And I'll tell you, I don't believe in lazy. Um, there's always a why. And so think about yourself on a day where maybe you have lots of things to do and you just don't do either one of them or all of them. Not necessarily that you're lazy. Think about the why for yourself. Oftentimes it's either I'm totally overwhelmed. I don't know where to begin. I don't know how to do it. Um, I'm, I'm so unfocused or just worked up that I can't get a task done. Um, and so there's always a why, and then as adults, we use the strategy when we need to, to sort of get it done. But kids don't have that insight naturally or have those strategies, and so we have to teach that. Um, does that make sense? Okay, so we sort of talked about this a minute ago when I talked about the teenager who just looks, right? So when I think of like social skills, I think of like, I'll hear a lot, oh, but they don't make eye contact, or they do make eye contact, but um, it's not meaningful, right? People, what we want them to understand is that people are actually communicating with their bodies and their facial expression, part of their message. And that can be a hard concept sometimes for them to even like wrap their brain around because they're like, no, they use their words. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and being able to attend to the cues, interpret the cues, again, sort of that same concept of, um, you know, just hearing the verbal information isn't enough. Does that make sense? The tone of voice really impacts, and sometimes reading tone of voice, particularly sarcasm, can be really tricky in humor. Questions about social skills versus developing a social competency. We talked about that. Um, so this is sort of, if we think about sort of baseline, baseline is not the word, building blocks, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, sort of building blocks of social um, development and communication. There's four kind of concepts that are important for them to understand regardless of age. And so it, your brain needs to be thinking about this. So I hear this a lot from kids um, with fidgets, right? Whether it's in the classroom or in my group. Fidgets are, one of the things I teach them is fidgets are only helpful when your brain can still think about what's happening in the classroom or the conversation or mom's talking to you, then a fidget is helpful. As soon as that fidget becomes your brain thinking about that, then it's no longer helpful and we have to switch strategies. Doesn't mean it's never helpful, it might mean that, 
But so the example I sometimes give is like putty, right? So putty can be really helpful in terms of calming the brain and body. Sometimes if you stick small things in there, like little erasers or little pennies and they have to pull it out, it's enough to kind of give energy, focus their energy in one spot, but still have their brain kind of thinking about what's happening around them. However, if I get all the pennies out and then I make a creature and I'm like, Right, right, and like I ask a question and nobody's answering. Well, now it's a distraction, right? So, um, helping them to understand that your brain needs to be thinking about kind of what the other person is thinking about. Some kids I work with will get caught up in their imagination and sort of be thinking about that. And so, one strategy I use is say, I can see that you are thinking about something really funny in your brain. And so I would love for you to either share that funny thing with the group, because that would make people feel good for you to connect with them, or can we turn that off and have, shift our brain to thinking about everybody else, right? So we're teaching them one, awareness, and then non-judgmentally giving them a strategy or a tool. Um, using your eyes, right? We talked about this in terms of reading cues, also helping them to understand that when we look in somebody's direction, it makes them feel heard. It makes them feel good and it helps to build connection. If we, if our brain is thinking about something and we're looking down the whole time, people feel like we don't care, right? And so if you need to fidget and your brain can think about it, you know, just periodically checking your surroundings, right? And looking up and, you know, thinking, looking at their cues to see, Hey, are we still good or verbalizing? And it really depends on the kid. This works with neurodiverse kids to neurodiverse kids. I'm, I'm, to I'm totally listening to you. And the other neurodiverse kids don't care. They're like, I don't like eye contact either. So, <laughs> um, using your body. So this is a big one. Being able to, this is not just nonverbal cues. This is how do I join my body into a group? So desks define my space, right? Like, especially if I have an assigned seat. I walk in and I sit in my seat, like I've joined the group, I've joined the class. But on the playground, there is no designated space. Where my space ends and your space begins, there's no like bubble that's defining it. It's all based on intuition. And, um, and so how do I figure out with that game of tag, if I'm over here and they're all over there and I'm like, hey, can I play? You know, they're gonna be like, one, I'm not gonna hear you, or two, you're too far away, so they don't really think you wanna play. Um, and so how do you bring your body into the group? Or if you have a lot of energy and you're hanging out with kids and you start like bouncing away from the group, the message you're sending with your body is that you don't, you're done playing with them. And that might not be the case. You just might need to get energy out. So how do you get energy out but keep your body in the group, right? So really kind of thinking about that. And then using your words, right? Using your words to connect with people, not just share all the information that you're excited about. So really thinking about what are our common interests? How do I, what can I say to kind of connect on those? Things like that. Questions about that? How do you distinguish between something that's a benefit or you know, what you're trying to achieve Mm -hmm. um, but it has its own negatives, and you know, I've been one thing about all this with, with Robbie. He can read a book, and you ask him about what happened, mm -hmm. and then or ask him to you know, write something about what happened, and he's completely stuck. Yeah, thirty minutes to get one sentence. Right. If you let him walk around the room and pace, mm -hmm. he can give you an entire dissertation yes. on what he read. Yeah. He's moved. So obviously it helps his performance, it helps his right. educational goals. Right. But so that's a great question. It's really about what's the goal in the moment. So the goal in that moment is for him to be able to reiterate what it is that he learned by reading, right? So however he needs to do that is should be acceptable. He needs the pace to be able to explain and somebody else like dictates, or we use voice to um, text with Google microphone, which might be a little tricky for Robbie sometimes, but um, then that's what we do. If the goal is um, that you're hanging out with other kids in a social situation, um, or 
it's gym class and you're pacing way over there, then the goal at that point is social. And so unless you need a break, which is okay, you just say, I need to go take a break, your body should be pacing in the same space. Does that make sense? Yes. And if it's in the classroom, mm -hmm. where it could be distracting for a child to pace or mm -hmm. whatever they're processing this, if they had a designated area mm -hmm. that they could go to. Yes, yes. Where they need to pace. And it could be for everybody in the classroom. If anybody needs to stretch the legs, this is our spot where you can stand as long as your brain is still thinking about what I'm teaching. Right? And so having that space to be able to do it. And if it's distracting, right, you might have to do it in the back of the room. Or maybe it's up here next to you so the kids aren't looking over there and they're helping you. Right? Like maybe there's a problem that needs to be done on the board and you see lots of fidgets and you're like, come on up here. We're gonna, we're gonna help me co-teach this, right? Like it, getting creative that way too. Other questions? Uh, oh, I got a question. Yes. I know you mentioned the word non-diverse. Yeah. Um, with that being said, oh, that's a good word that a lot of people are using. Mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. You know, and so how would you describe, is a neurodiverse focusing basically on is that just mostly the social aspect was it more of looking at like different types of um diagnoses along as like two different parts coming yeah. together is that what the neurodiverse or neurodivergent child means that's a great question because neurodiverse it's, to my knowledge we we right now we all sort of have our own little definition when i use neurodiverse I'm talking about the kids, regardless of diagnosis, it could be ADHD, it could be anxiety, it could be high functioning autism, regardless of diagnosis, they're on par with their peers from an academic or um, cognitive standpoint, communication standpoint in terms of language, but there's an area that gives them uh, difficulties. So it might be inattention because of ADHD, it might be dyslexia because of reading, it might be social skills, you know, like it, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But there is um, not a, right now, a like consistent, it sort of came out of um, the high functioning autism Asperger's community um, is sort of what drove that neurodiversity language um, because they feel like it's a diversity issue, not a disability. So I want the people who are non-neurodiverse to take the time to understand me just like I have to take the time to understand you. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you this last thing. This is a strategy that I use to teach um, social understanding of perspective. It's a great tool when there's conflict, but it's not the only time I use it. Um, so I'm gonna use an example of a high schooler that I worked with back in Massachusetts who, um, who um, was in title autism, he was in all general education classes, very bright. And I got an email from the math teacher saying, in the middle of class, he yelled out, move out of the way, and it was totally disrespectful, and he needs to be suspended because it was out of line, and he's teaching these other kids to disrespect me. And so I said, okay, well, let me, let me talk to him first. So I think I have my next slide, but let me check. Okay, so... <clears throat> What we did was, I said, okay, well, we gotta figure out the why behind him yelling move, right? Like, he, what's the why behind that action? So I said, what was in your brain that made you think that you should yell? I was thinking the teacher was standing in front of the board because she was writing, and I thought she doesn't want me to learn. And I felt really anxious and frustrated because I wanted to learn, and so I yelled, move, and I yelled at the teacher. So we've got thoughts, feelings, words, actions. What he didn't think about was the other perspective as well as the big picture, right? So the teacher's perspective, what were, what, he made these predictions. So what do you think the teacher's predictions were 
uh, what were her thoughts about the situation? That was rude. He needs to be disciplined. Um, I'm, I'm disrespecting. I feel mad. I emailed the, the principal and I yelled, don't take that tone with me. And so he was really baffled. He's like, well, I don't know what to do in this situation. And I said, do you know how I know that the teacher actually did not not want you to learn? And he was like, no. And this is where that just all big picture comes in. Well, why do you think teachers go to school to be teachers? Like, what is their role? And it's, well, to teach students. Okay, why do they want to teach students? Well, because they want them to learn. Right, so in my brain, I'm thinking that teachers typically go to school because they want kids to learn. So that might not be a true statement. And then I stood in front of the board and I said, I want you to watch my body. Watch and don't say anything. And so I write and I go, ready? What did I just do? And he said, well, you moved away from the board. I go, right. One thing I also have in my brain that I know is that when the teacher's done writing, she will move her body because she wants the kids to learn so that everybody can see it. And so all of a sudden he had a different perspective. It wasn't that she didn't want me to learn. She actually wanted me to learn and I just needed to give her more time. So the strategy we came up with is count to five, right? And then raise your hand and say, I can't see the board, right? So that's very different. And if we do that, will the teacher still have the thought that you're rude? Well, no, because I'm not yelling at her and um, I'm not using demanding language. Okay, and so is she gonna yell at you and say, don't take that toe with me? No, right. Is she gonna feel disrespectful and mad? No. Is she gonna email the, perfect, the principal? No, right, because so just by changing your words and actions, you're changing the other person's thoughts and feelings, which changes how they treat you in that situation. So again, sort of that big picture circle of how do my thoughts and feelings impact others, and how does that impact me? Does that make sense? Cool. Can I play devil's advocate for a yeah. second? Yeah, go ahead. Because this plays into what you talked about using you know, neurodiversity yep. and being different so mm -hmm. we understand and not a disability. Mm -hmm. One could take the position that the teacher overreacted oh, by yeah. not understanding <laughs> the neurodiverse student. Yes. And the escalation didn't need to happen and you know emailing the principal and everything else mm -hmm. you could stop and say you've done something unexpected and that's yelling why did that happen mm -hmm. yeah i find most people don't do that but so you're totally right in that the teacher overreacted and this teacher has a pattern and we were working on educating her which was a process and you know some people get it and some people don't and so um, in that moment, my goal, knowing what I know about the teacher and her ability to adapt, I knew that wasn't going to happen. No, I didn't say, I wasn't demanding in this particular oh, instance, yeah. but I'm just using it today yeah. as a generalized yeah. example. Yeah, hmm. I talk about it with kids all the time. When we talk about conflict, and this is a conflict, everybody plays a role in the conflict. And we all have conflict. So in this situation, she yelled, she overreacted, and she emailed the principal. Those were her contributions to the conflict. Yours was you yelled and used demanding language to somebody who's of higher authority. We need to ask people of higher authority, not demand. Otherwise, there's consequences. But I agree. Continued education. Go ahead. Oh no, it reminds me of even parenting. Yes. You know, I overreact sometimes when my 13 year old talks yeah. back. Because you think in your head, you think she's going to be disrespectful. Right. She's going to disrespect her. Right. But you go down that kind of rabbit hole yeah. without even, and so yeah. you overreact. Yeah. Instead of, yeah. And one of the <laughs> things I always mm -hmm. will say to parents is own that. Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and own that piece, mm -hmm. Apolo explain it, apologize, and tell them what you either would do different or will try to do different next time. By doing that, you're teaching them self-regulation strategies, insight, and social problem solving. Other questions? No? Then that's it. Oh, this is just a visual, which is a little blurry. It has like how all the language and things are. And then that's me. No. All right.
Thank you, Katie. You are very welcome. I hope that was helpful. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, that was very helpful. My email is on those cards if you have questions that you think of after um, after the presentation, because inevitably you chew on something and you're like, hmm, I have a question. So if you think of something, just reach out. I'm happy to be a resource or answer a question if I can. All right. It was nice meeting you all. Yeah. Question now or of course you can. Yeah. I keep wondering how my child, um, in terms of overreacting mm -hmm. to other children, yeah, and then they kind of learn that about him and they'll push his buttons. Mm. How do I teach mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm overreacting when I overreact? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we talk about the size of the problem. Um, so first I want to know what is, what is the why behind the overreaction? Sometimes it's, um, if they're real concrete thinkers, it's rule-based, like they're not following the rules and I want them to follow the rules. Winning, losing is another common one, um, or controlling the situation is, can be another one. And so then when it doesn't happen, there's an overreaction. Um, so one kind of targeting that and then two what we talk about are what are the characteristics and I shift this language so what are the characteristics that you want in a good friend do you want somebody and have them come up with a list well I want them to be kind okay so when when what do I one of the things I notice is that Jimmy when you're around Jimmy you tend to get upset a lot why do you think that is is it possible that there's something about Jimmy's doing, his actions, that he's making a choice, and that maybe he doesn't have the qualities of a friend you deserve? So as opposed to Jimmy doesn't like you, or Jimmy doesn't want to be friends, you deserve a better friend than Jimmy. So shifting that perspective to give them the power. And let's think about who is worthy of being a good friend, and let's seek them out and avoid Jimmy. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? No. Okay. Cool. Thank you. It was nice meeting you all. Thank you. And um, Caroline, thanks for the opportunity. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for you listening. This so is welcome. Welcome. wonderful. And let me know if you need anything. Um,